welcome to the Culture Cast. I'm Chris Stashu, and I'm joined by my good friend. You have heard him on here before. He is the host of the award-winning Projection Booth Podcast. I was said Production Booth Podcast. What the fuck? Projection Booth Podcast, Mr. Mike White. I don't think I've won any awards. Yeah, but, like, that, that doesn't matter. Facts can be manipulated as we see fit. Oh, that's true. That's don't true. you know? Mm-hmm. <laughs> what? What timeline are you living in? <laughs> I'm living in the timeline of objectivity is dead, subjectivity reigns supreme. <laughs> What's not a joke is Babe Pig in the City, and that's the film we're talking about on this episode of the Culture Cast. This is the farm. Peaceful. Calm. Civilized. But now, the only chance to save the farm. <laughs> is for one little pig. He can't leave. You're my lucky pig. <laughs> to go to the city. You can't leave. Uh, you can't leave. Anybody home? Uh, anybody else? Somebody. Let me in. Let me in. He's entered a world of outcasts and misfits. Who are these losers? <laughs> well, hey, slow down. If you're not a cat, stay at chat. I'm Fleetly, come back. We don't know where it's been. Separated from his owner. I seem to have lost my human. Totally on his own. You're just a little pig in the big city. What can you possibly do? What can anyone do? Destiny has changed his mission. <laughs> and his courage is about to change everyone's lives. Whatever the pig says, goes. Signed by Moi. My tummy hurts. Pack your bags. Time to go. We're going outside without a human. And hang on tight. Let go, Felix! <laughs> And the duck. Witness to insanity. From the heart of the city comes the story of a pig with heart. I have a professional obligation to be malicious. Then you should change jobs. That'll do, pig. That'll do. Babe, pig in the city. This place can really take it out of you. Tell me about it. I'm still hungry. So Bay Pig in the City is directed by George Miller. Yes, that George Miller. We've talked about it a couple times, and we will talk about it a lot more on this episode. George Miller, director of such films as Mad Max, Mad Max 2, Mad Max Fury Road, Happy Feet 1 and 2. It's a very, he has a very varied filmography. Film stars James Cromwell, Miriam Margulis, Hugo Weaving, Magda Subansky, and it picks up where the first film left off, the first film being Babe. First film was all about Babe and how Babe became a, a sheep herding pig as opposed to a sheep herding dog. And uh, an accident happens at the beginning of this movie, and Babe and Mr. Hoggett's wife, played by Magda Zubansky, go on an adventure to the big city. What big city? Seems to be an amalgamation of a lot of big cities. All We're the big talk- cities. <laughs> yes, pretty much. Uh, but let's just get right into it. Mike, was this your first time watching Babe, Pig in the City? It was. I have a friend, you know, I used to do a zine called Cashews to Cinemart, and I had a friend, a playwright, uh, David McGregor, and he wrote an article for me years and years ago about how Babe, Pig in the City is just the best film ever made. And I read the article, and I was like, oh, wow, this sounds pretty incredible. Um, I think he might have raised my expectations a little too much, because when I watched it, I was just like, yeah, it's pretty good. But best film ever made i wasn't feeling that so likewise to yourself i have um the first two films this month one of them we already talked about legends of the guardians or legend of the guardians as i miss said it so many times apologies to any legend of the guardians fans because there are 
out there. I know you're out there. You oh, comment yeah. on my YouTube video <laughs> or my YouTube posting of the podcast. So first off, sorry for fucking up the name so many times, but this is another film that is a fantasy film that I have had people telling me to watch for quite some time. Unironically, as this friend of yours that you were talking about wrote an article for you, unironically, I'm assuming. Yes. Yeah, not uh, not only did he write an article, but then years later, I went to see a play that he performed and wrote, and one of the characters in the play actually starts going off on how great Babe Pig in the City is. And I'm just like, okay, yeah, he really likes this movie. This is the hill that you want to die on, my friend. <laughs> it's his thing, man. I'm like, okay, hey, David, go for it. Well, so here's the thing. I can see someone getting as wrapped up in this movie as your friend. Mm -hmm. It is not a film for children no. at all. It is the antithesis of a children's film. It is a children's film. It is an adult film masquerading as a children's film based solely on the poster slash cover art of the film. The way I describe the plot also should seem like a children's film, but at its core, it is not a children's film. At its core, it actually is pretty topical in a kind of surprising way and we'll get to the kind of the themes of the film but like like i was saying like yourself i had people talk this film up to me and i think they did the same thing your friend did i think they oversold it that's not to say it's a bad movie i actually really enjoyed it i think people need to calm the fuck down when it comes to talking about how great <laughs> this movie is because when someone says, it's amazing, it feels like you're quantifying it based off of the fact that it looks like a children's film. Right. Children's films can be good anyways. They don't aren't all bad. I know we talked about it in the last episode. I'm curious your thoughts, Mike. I mean, children's entertainment, you know, for kids, there is the sense that it is not given the most thought because the assumption is kids don't need much to be entertained. I really don't agree with that i mean i know i'm not i'm not saying that that's reality yeah no. i'm saying that's perception i don't think that that's that's your statement that's like the perception and right. i i disagree with that perception i mean having a now six-year-old granddaughter and watching the stuff that she watches i mean i'm seeing references to all these different things i'm seeing some very very good writing, some very funny things that are going on. Um, so, I mean, and I've been watching, I mean, that fuck, I've been watching SpongeBob for like 20 years, you know, and, and like, uh, the fairly odd parents, just, there are so many good children's programs out there and great kids movies too. There are some really shitty ones, but there are some great ones out there as well. So yeah, you can't lump everything into just a big old bag and say, yeah, kids entertainment is just mindless. No, and that's unfortunate because the public perception is that. It is that children's entertainment doesn't warrant an adult sitting down and giving it fair attention. I mean, you hear about it all the time. Oh, I'm being dragged to go see Frozen 2 by my kids. First off, Frozen 2 is actually pretty good. Yeah. Uh, like, in regards to what it's talking about in the film, it might be a little kids' gloves with the themes, but it's also for kids. Like, the, the kids aren't going to be approached in the way an adult would be to talk about the themes of the movie. And that's okay. That's perfectly fine. But, yeah, this idea that, like, children's entertainment is, is effectively lesser entertainment because it's for kids really bugs me because you watch something like this, which, again, on its face is for kids... And it's nothing like a normal children's film. It's not a children's film at all. And I appreciate that you have people and studios taking chances on more, I wouldn't say adult, but more kind of mature children's films. Because children are very impressionable at an early age, and a lot of the things that they see when they're growing up are going to make a lasting impact on them. And... It's important to not just feed them the same bullshit over and over again. It's important to find things that maybe push the boundaries a little bit, that introduce some interesting topics and themes to them in a way that they can understand. And then we come to Babe Pig in the City, which is kind of a melange of all of those things. Yeah. It, it gets dark. It gets real really dark. Really dark. Yeah. Really dark. 
Yeah. I mean, at one point, there's a dog drowning in a river, and all the animals are just like, this is what it is. Bye bye. And well, Babe's that one, like, fuck no. <laughs> that puppy who says, oh, uh, my owner put me in a bag and threw me in a lake. I was just like, what? Yeah, I know. And that's like right after the scene that I was talking about. So it's just like, it just, it doesn't give up its soul in being a children's film. And that's, that's kind of the thing that children's film kind of feels soulless because they're entertainment made for kids. And this film does not fall into that trap of being soulless because it really approaches and addresses topics like animal abuse in a way that's like shockingly endearing for a film about a CGI mouthed animal mm-hmm. puppet at times. Yeah, and I like the way that they will integrate the puppetry with the action. So I mean it's almost always pretty evident when you're dealing with a puppet versus a right. CGI mouthed animal, but hey, it works. Well, look, this film came out in 98, so we're not even anywhere near where we are now with CGI animals. I mean, even looking as far back as the last movie we talked about, Legend of the Guardians, all CGI came out 12 years after this film. So that's how big of a leap they're taking in regards to the quality of the CGI. But to your point, for the most part, rather seamless. I mean, when they cut in close on Babe at one point early on in the film, when Babe is in a cage talking to the, oh God, what's the kind of animal? The beagle, excuse me. At the airport, very obviously a puppet. But there's something just so endearing about late 90s, like animal animatronics. That, like, you know, because, again, I would have been eight years old when this film came out. So there's something about it that's just inherently endearing to me that I kind of associate with my childhood. So it doesn't irk me. And it's good puppetry, too. Oh, yeah. I mean, as opposed to that nightmare call of the wild with Harrison Ford from, what, last year? I thought it was this year. (laughs) Was it? Of who I think it may have been early 2020, though 2020 in and of itself every week feels like a year, so... And that thing, I I want to see the cut of that where it is just the guy in the suit pretending to be a dog. You know, that's what I want to see. Because it's, as a movie, uh, uh, having that CGI dog doesn't work. Having a dude pretending to be a dog throughout the entire movie, I think might have worked. I didn't watch it because it looked just... I mean, again, I have a hard time with... CGI animal movies like that because it's like I know at the end of the day there's not a real performance from an animal. <laughs> like it's very obviously CGI. He was acting with a dude. I mean it was very Andy Circus, Lord of the Rings, painting the guy out, but having the guy like with the 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 arm stilts like almost like uh Planet of the Apes, having him there so that the eye lines matched, it was nuts to see the making of it. The making of sounds almost more interesting than the film. Yeah, yeah. But back back to Babe. So a film like this, at least in my opinion, I'm curious, your opinion, Mike, outside of the viewable aspects of it, the CGI, the puppetry, the acting, this film is going to live and die on its voice acting and the voice actors' performances. Because again, all voice acting is not created the same. If you go and watch a lot of cheaply made cartoons... You can tell when the actors are phoning it in, and they just don't care, and they seem disinterested, and they're there for the paycheck. This film, on the other hand, the all of the voice actors are fantastic, even the fact that they replaced Christine Cavanaugh, who plays Babe in the first film, with E.G. Daly, who would go on to portray Tommy Pickles in Rugrats, while Christine Cavanaugh would go on to portray, or at the same time, I believe, Chucky in the Rugrats. And it's hilarious if you watch the first film and then the second film, how much in this film it sounds like Tommy Pickles from the Rugrats, <laughs> and how much in the first film it sounds like Chucky from the Rugrats. But what's even more amusing is they kind of sound so similar that if you're watching the Rugrats cartoons, you kind of don't notice. But if you're watching something like this, where those two performances were captured separately, it's so obvious. I've never actually seen the Rugrats. I was a little past my time. When I hear her, though, I hear um, Buttercup from uh, the Powerpuff Girls. That's that's after the Rugrats. <laughs> that's after Rugrats, isn't it? It might have been. I think been. you must have just missed Rugrats, which is fine, because Rugrats is, you know, the, a cartoon for kids. Like, 
Right. And yeah. when Powerpuff Girls came out, somebody tipped me off. Like, this, there's actually really funny stuff in there. And so I ended up watching that and then used any excuse, like, take my niece to go see the Powerpuff Girls movie. And it was just like, yeah, I, Allison, let's go see this. It'll be fun. And then there's all these, there was like a whole chain of jokes in there that are all about Van Halen songs. So I'm just like, yep, this is great. Okay. Yeah, and I mean, Rugrats, uh, again, ostensibly, you know, dismissing it offhand, as a kid's show, it had some jokes in it that were not for kids. I remember one of the episodes, they talk about uh, the kids, uh, Tommy Pickles actually gets Sasquatch confused with Satchmo, (laughs) as in Louis Armstrong, and so they're talking about how Satchmo is coming to get them when they're camping out in the woods, and (laughs) Satchmo is going to get them, and like... Again, as a kid, there's no way you get that fucking joke. Right. Like, you know, even if you're a rather learned young child whose parents maybe let them listen to jazz music, you might not put two and two together. And you see stuff like that in Bay Pig in the City because from the get go, you know that this film, it's not taking place at the farm. Obviously, it's taking place in the city. And James Cromwell's character gets practically murdered at the beginning of the film. I do like that we are moving from the farmer to the wife and that this is so much her story. Oh, yeah. And that he just, like you said, he almost gets murdered at the the beginning. He just gets taken care of, put on ice. We are going to deal with this woman and we're going to move the entire thing away from the farm. And now we're going to deal with her and her adventures. And I was really okay with that. I, I was glad to be able to focus on her. And I do have to call out, did you notice that our friend from Barney Miller, Roscoe Lee Brown, I did. is the narrator of this story. Those pipes, we were talking about how beautiful those pipes are, and him lending his vocal talents to this as that omniscient narrator. I was so happy. Well, so I watched the first one before I watched this one, and he's also the narrator in the first one. Oh, good. Something, something I had also forgotten, again, to your point, and so... Like, hearing that voice, and I was like, this sounds so familiar. And then, obviously, I went and looked, and yeah, it's Roscoe Lee Brown, who is, again, a standout, like you mentioned, in Marnie Miller. But it it is it, it gives the film, and there's kind of some interstitials as well with the mice that they do in the first film. Yep, yep. That it gives it that storybook fairy tale quality. Because this is, this film's not really, what's funny is, The first film ostensibly takes place in reality, right? Outside of the fact that it's talking animals, it's heightened reality, or it's kind of fantastical reality, still takes place on their farm, still takes place in reality. This film says, fuck that, (laughs) and decides, we're just going to set this in the metropolis, wherever that is. And like you said, I appreciate that the film says, I'm not just going to make another movie about babe running around herding sheep i want to do something interesting and have something interesting to say and i i want to give some of the credit to george miller and judy morris and mark lamperl judy morris we talked about her last month she was in razorback uh playing beth winters the three of them have clearly crafted a story that they have something they want to say Uh and there are a couple themes in the film that it kind of sticks to but you have to give them credit for looking at this film and you know looking at the first film and going we don't want to tell a story about a pig that herds sheep we want to tell a story about animal racism and classism well and kind of um people uh what would you say like illegal aliens is what yeah. I've picked out a lot with, the, especially this hotel where it's like, no, 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 we don't cater to those people. But then, you know, you kind of sneak people into the side door and it's this haven for for basically illegals, quote unquote, where it's like, oh, OK. And so they actually have a place where they can all, all go. And then it's threatened by this piece of shit that lives across the way from them who's just like, oh, they're, they're at it again. They're at it again. This Mrs. Kravitz like on steroids kind of thing. And I did like her come up and sat at the end. That was nice. But yeah, this whole idea of, like you were saying, it's like racism, animal rights, uh, um, uh, illegal aliens, just so many things can be read into this metaphor, these animals in the hotel. And I don't think it's outside of the realm of reality that those themes match up with the film. I mean, sometimes, and you know, 
especially with your podcast, we we talk about more loftier films, more ex, you know experimental stuff, stuff that's not going to show up on my podcast, and it's not because I don't like it. It's just that's not really my bag versus the projection booth. It's interesting to see a film like this, which wears its themes so on its sleeve, uh-huh. because you don't have to do a lot of digging. That's kind of what I'm getting at. It's it you know. When you watch some films, it's like, I think that this film is about this. The Shining is a perfect example in something like Room 237. (laughs) It's about the Native Americans being conquered by the white man. It's like, dude, that's a fucking stretch. (laughs) Like, you're able and allowed to interpret art however the hell you want, but sometimes you're stretching it. In a film like this, what you just talked about, not a stretch at all. Mm -mm. No. No, it's right there on the surface, just waiting for people to discover it. Also, the way that law enforcement is treated in this, it's pretty interesting. Uh, I, I really appreciated that. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the beagle that you're talking about earlier, how he's just like, oh yeah, if I rat you out, basically I'll get a treat. And then to actually see him there with like that big bowl of food and stuff as, as me, the, the wife is, uh, you know, getting strip searched and all this, just all these horrible things happening to her and to babe. And then her, uh, Esme out there calling for a pig. And then the way that that, you know, sets off the cops and just how, again, how horrible her life is at that point when she gets arrested. It's just like, wow, the, they are really, you know, taking it out on the police in a good way, you know, like deservedly so for a lot of stuff. And I do like this theme that they have in here too of these like, pig men that kind of help her out at times the guy who's at the airport where they get stuck for a while and then the judge who are they played by the same actor perhaps but they both have this the same pig nose going on and i'm just like what is this are these guys who were the half breeds or something this is really strange i don't know what was going on again it's 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 wearing its themes and its imagery on its sleeve <laughs> It's it's not it's not unintentional, obviously. Mm. So, uh, you know, I don't know. Again, this this the first film had such a heightened sense of fantastical reality. And this film just pushes it essentially into fantastical, not even reality at any more. I mean, you, you see a point where there's a shot of Babe looking out the window at the metropolis. And I think you can see the opera house, the MetLife building, the Hollywood sign. I want to say you could see the Statue of Liberty as well. Yeah. And you see the Golden Gate Bridge, the Sydney Opera House, you might have already said. I was just looking up. They are two different people. It's Van Epperson as the night cleaner and Kim Story as the judge. So they are two different actors doing that. But it wouldn't surprise me if they were the same one. Yeah. I mean, again, it's the the film is very obviously trying to have something to say and you know, as much as I like it, and this is kind of where the critique comes in, it felt like it should have picked one thing, not like six, because it gets a little muddy toward the end, which is unfortunate because the final sequence of this film is fucking insane. Uh-huh. Uh, it is it is physical comedy in a film that is not, I guess it is a comedy. I don't know what the hell to consider Babe, the first one. It's... A drama about a pig that's a sheep herder, and this film is a drama about a pig that's a sheep herder that goes to the city. I mean, I don't find these movies funny. I know it's supposed to be a comedy. It's billed as a comedy on both Wikipedia and IMDb. Not that those are any sort of bar by which we measure everything, but those are just general titles and tags given to things. I didn't find this movie funny. Did you? I found parts of it funny. I liked the way that... um Stephen Wright, well, just Stephen Wright's voice. I was going to say, Stephen Wright, whenever he's in anything, it, it's kind of hard to not typecast him, you I, know? Yeah. And I liked the way that he was abusing English, and just, I was glad that I had the subtitles on while I was watching this to see the roots of the words that he was taking and twisting, so I, I appreciated his dialogue quite a bit. I mean, this movie... I almost turned it off at first just because when the, the, what is it, like the capuchin goes up and steals the, um, 
uh, the suitcase and then takes it right. down to their room and everybody's just like, what are you talking about? You know, just kind of like doing that, like gaslighting to babe, that kind of stuff really pisses me off in movies. And I'm just like, why are you doing this? You know, like listen to this pig, this pig is trying to, you know, set things right. Why isn't anybody paying attention? It's like Lemony Snicket. Like I can't stand watching Lemony Snicket because it's like the kids, know that shit's going down and the kids keep trying to say stuff and all the adults aren't listening. And it's almost the same way where once, you know, babe is able to, you know, talk to, uh, well, he can't talk to, but once, uh, the Mickey Rooney character comes in, I'm just like, okay, good. Now they'll get it all sorted out. Or the woman that runs a hotel will sort this thing out or something, but it never happens. And I was just like super angry. And I know that's the inciting incident to really kick the movie into gear, but I was just so angry watching that. So I didn't find that funny at all. Um, there were moments where I laughed, but for the most part, there was some, like we talked about deadly serious stuff. The whole thing of the orangutan who feels naked when he's not wearing clothes. And he just seems like the most, uh, poignant character in the entire film. Like I r- would have almost liked a movie just about that character. Well, and I give a lot of credit to that, to James Cosmo, who, I mean, he's a fantastic Scottish character actor, train spotting, Braveheart, Highlander, Ben-Hur, the new Ben-Hur, unfortunately, uh, Chronicles of Narnia. His performance is so kind of what you expect from him if you know who he is as an actor, that it's not really anything that he's not normally asked to do. But again, that performance really would normally have no place in a film like this. Uh But yet it totally works and it totally makes sense. And you have this great payoff at the end of the film where he's the one who saves the final baby chimpanzee that falls from the, the chandelier. And you kind of see his character come full circle and you see him accept babe. And then you see, all of them end up at the farm at the end of the film. Spoilers, but I mean, come on. Even if it is not a film for a younger audience, it does still have a happy ending, thank God. Yes. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, at the end of the film, if they were all loaded up into a truck and there's the shot of the back of the truck being lifted up and it says, you know, fucking animal food factory, I wouldn't have been fucking surprised. Yeah. I mean, with this movie kind of going for it, if all the uh, sort of at the end, it was just like, and they were all cut up into animal food. It's like, what the fuck movie? But you do have a character other than the main character. And you actually have several characters who go on a transformative journey together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, coming back to Stephen Wright's character, even Stephen Wright's character, who is a, like you mentioned, kind of gaslighting chimpanzee, even he has a journey. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody seems to learn something throughout this. I mean, even what, what's the dog's name? Fleelick, the one who's got the, the wheels. I mean, he yep. becomes like a hero in this movie. He, he, I don't want to say he doesn't have any right to be a hero, but like babe, babe should be the hero. But yet Fleelick is the one that does like a really selfless act in the way that he grabs on to that woman's coat and, and gets pulled all the way to the hospital. It's like, okay, this is pretty cool. And when he gets rolled over and he's, you know, dreaming, he's in the other world and stuff. I'm just like, oh shit, I, I, at least he's dreaming. So he's not dead, but I thought for sure he might've died in that moment. I feel like, and now I couldn't find the script and this is the only cut of the film. Mike, I feel like the dog was supposed to die. <laughs> like, I feel like that whole scene was, they added the dream sequence after. Like, I swear to God, because I know that the character ends up it later in the film, but like that felt like such a like, such an obvious spot to like really raise the stakes. Uh-huh. And the, not like the stakes in this film aren't already high. I mean, when you have half of the cast, the animal cast of the film being captured by the you know the animal control officers, it's pretty high stakes as it is. But yeah, the the scene where Felix's uh, little doggy wheelchair is like sitting and spinning on the ground. It was Ugh, oh my god! Like, the bent wheel, the shot of the like over I know. the bent wheel. It's like oh my god, what happened to this poor dog? And guess what? I give a lot of that credit to Andrew Lesney, cinematographer, and George Miller. Like that right there. Like yeah. director George Miller. Say what you want about Mad Max Fury Road. I think everyone has said everything about Mad Max Fury Road at this point. I like Mad Max Fury Road. 
we did a podcast on it oh so many years ago. I think it's a little overrated, me personally. I think it's much more of a technical masterpiece than it is a, a good movie. I think it's an interesting chase film. But George Miller has an eye for these kinds of things. And I love watching directors outside of their comfort zone. Because again, this is also George Miller's first younger audience film. Obviously, his next film after this would be fully embracing a younger audience in a film like Happy Feet. And then Happy Feet 2 is very similar to Babe Pig in the City in that it has existential krill in the film, which is my favorite part of that movie. Uh, but it is it is all credit goes to the script and the direction for pulling off a scene like the dog's wheelchair spinning. I don't think a lot of other directors would have focused on it and given it that moment that it needed to really impact you as the audience. So first off, Fury Road is one of the best movies ever made. Second off, I didn't realize. <laughs> are you? Are, are you? You're not fucking with me, right? I I fucking love that movie. Okay. I watch I that. Mean, I, I get it. I 100 percent get it. Um, I didn't realize that he didn't direct the first Babe. I thought that nope. he directed both. So when you're like, oh, this is his first foray into children's entertainment, I was just like, yeah, he directed the first one. So that's even more ballsy that they took. This stuff, you know, took the characters and then recast everything into this. It's just I, that that is making my head spin. Well, the the original director of the first movie, Chris Noonan, apparently falling out. He didn't even show up to the Australian screening of this film, which is unfortunate because, look, I, the first Babe is a great film. Mm -hmm. It is a very well made heart kind of it grabs your heart and doesn't let go. It's a very well made film with some good performances. James Cromwell specifically. And... This film is completely different. I, I I would venture a guess that if you went to see this film, and I was looking at some... Oh, the reviews. The reviews are so, fucking brutal. Oh, yes, they brutal. are. Yes, they are. But I also look at it as adults having no idea how to approach a film like that. I think people were taken... I mean, I don't think. People were taken aback by this fucking movie. There were people who hated it, but at the same time, I did see so many people who just loved the shit out of it. And I was like, okay. But the people that hated it, man, did they hate this movie. Yeah, and look, I mean, yeah, George Miller worked on the first one. Chris Noonan has said, oh, George Miller tried to kick me off the, you know, kick my credit off the first movie. Hey, you know what? We're not here to argue that. We've already argued Spielberg and Toby Hooper before, and that went pretty well. But... If you went into this film expecting the first movie, <laughs> <laughs> which I guess every reviewer did, and you know what? I don't blame them because, again, you're making a film for a younger audience. Why would you stray that far from the formula like they did? Yeah, the reviews are not good. I mean, the reviews are shocking. It's like they didn't even watch the same movie. I mean, really, when you look at George Miller's filmography, like, that was the thing that amazed me. Because we did, like, a, I don't know, fucking four-hour podcast, maybe more, on uh, the Mad Max series. That uh, the first... I mean, all of the 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 Road Warrior movies, all the Mad Max movies, are so different. Like the the, you could look at Mad Max and look at uh, the Road Warrior, and you'd be like, "Is this the same person that made this?" Like, yeah, the like Mel Gibson's still there, but he's not even the same type of guy. Like, this is really just such a departure from this. And you look at the third one, which turns into a fucking kids film at one point, And you're just like, what the fuck is going on here? Is this the same guy that made this? I mean, so I'm not surprised that Millie just was like so far away from what the original movie was. Well, and it cracks me up that it is George Miller and it, it is mind blowing to a lot of folks to go, Oh yeah. George Miller directed happy feet. Uh -huh. Right? Like, if you go tell someone who is not kind of as much of a movie nerd as you and I are, hey, by the way, the guy who directed Mad Max Fury Road directed fucking Happy Feet 1 and 2, they'd be like, no, it's not the same guy. It's like, yeah, no, it is. Totally. Is. And well, I thought it was another case of the man who composed the music for The Road Warriors named Brian May, but there's... Right. That's the other Brian May, not the Brian May from Queen. I honestly thought that there were two George Millers. I thought there was the George Miller who does Babe and Happy Feet and these movies, and then there's the George Miller who makes you know the Road Warrior movies. I'm not sure where the Lorenzo Oil Witches of Eastwick George Miller fits into that stuff, but I honestly thought that there were two guys, because I didn't think that there was any way that the man who gave me 
just me and anybody else who's watching the movie turn it off now. It gave me Road Warrior. I I was like, there's no way that he could have done this other stuff. And then when I found out, no, there's just one singular director doing all of this stuff, it, I just was even more impressed. First off, Lorenzo's Oil is a thoroughly traumatizing film for 15 to 16-year-old Chris to be watching. Oof. Well, we watched it in a biology class, and, you know, intentions were good, but listening to a child actor scream for, like, effectively a two-hour movie is not the way you teach biology. (laughs) It's the way you teach biology biology if you're lazy as fuck, but normally you look forward to movie day at school, right? That's kind of the whole joke, oh, the teacher... For those of you who are maybe too young to remember this, but a, a lot of you would, when the teacher would wheel the CRT TV in on the roller with the stand and go sit at their desk and fuck off for an hour, and you'd watch something. Lorenzo's Oil, not what I wanted to watch. And funny enough, do you know what the second film and only other film we watched in that biology class was, Mike? Steel Magnolias. Wow. Just because she had diabetes? I no, I thought she had some. Doesn't Julia Roberts's character have some something some genetic? I don't remember. I all I know is Steel Magnolias has Olympia Dukakis in it, best actress name on the planet. So I I don't know what George Miller was doing before Bay Pig in the City with Lorenzo's Oil and Forty Thousand Years of Dreaming. Um, but yeah, this movie is just it's it is weird. You know, again, focusing on the reviews, because Roger Ebert, who, again, I do not take anything he says as the gospel truth. Roger Ebert wrote books about movies he hated. So you tell me who's doing, you know, you tell me who's not doing harm to the industry he's part of. (laughs) Um, He gave this movie a four out of four and said that it was better than the first one. Glowing review. He's one of the few really glowing reviews for this film. Yeah. Which is shocking. You never knew with him what was going to happen. I mean, there were a couple safe bets where it was just like, okay, boys in the hood, he's going to give it thumbs up. Um, Menace to society, he's going to give it thumbs up. But anything else, who knows where he's going to go with this stuff. Well, I remember when Siskel and Ebert got into a huge uh, kind of holier-than-thou debate about, like, Nightmare on Elm Street. And they're like, this is tantamount to pornography. It's like, you guys, you... Old fucking fuddy duddies. <laughs> Even then, I mean, you go back and look, and Father, I wish Father Malone was here for this because Father Malone and I have dubbed each other Siskel and Ebert because we know how much it pisses the other off. Huh. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, Gene Siskel was, in my opinion, I'm curious your thoughts. He was the better of the pair, but he mm. also died. I I liked Roger more. Really? Yeah. And I don't mean Roger Ebert. I liked Roger more. I liked Roger Ebert. Timothy Uh Dalton, I think, could have (laughs) gotten some better scripts. I really wanted to like him, but I think the writing was to blame. God damn it. Thank you. Thank you for that. (laughs) Thank you so much. And we're just going to continue on and not address anything we just said. Um, (laughs) But it is it is shocking to kind of hear now, because if you look now, it, this film has been kind of lumped in with, quote, cult classics, whatever the fuck that means. Modern cult canon, you know, reading articles about kind of where this film sits now in 2020, it has a fair amount of defenders. And not defenders, but people that will sing its praises. Clearly, you know someone. I know someone. So it's in our immediate circle, but they're not the only ones. And they all are coming at this film getting the same thing from it, that it's a film worth watching outside of the, oh, it's a movie about a pig Mm -hmm. that talks. Right. It shouldn't be that mind blowing that there's a ostensibly a kid's movie that is hiding an agenda that talks about other things because we've seen that many times before. I mean, (laughs) that's one of the things I love to talk about when I talk about Czechoslovakian films is You have something on the surface, and you have so many things underneath the surface. Like, looking at Uri Hertz's Beauty and the Beast, and it's like, yeah, sure, it's a retelling of Beauty and the Beast, but there's so much more going on. You know, 
every every fucking fairy tale has so much more going on. So we shouldn't be shocked that Babe Pig in the City is actually a very deep story. But I know that that blows people's minds. I'm not trying to deprecate their opinion. I'm just like, yeah, no, that that makes sense. But also at the same time, like you were saying, slow your roll a little bit when it comes to recommending this movie. Don't overdo it. If you love this movie, that's great. I'm not saying keep it to yourself, but don't overdo it when you recommend it to other people because you got to realize that you're setting the bar so high. Yeah, and that is the unfortunate thing. And again, like you said, I'm not blaming anyone for it. And I completely understand because, look, I'm sure if I asked you a movie, Mike, that you would get as equally animated about, that's maybe like lesser known, which for the two of us is not fucking hard. But, I mean... You and I, I mean, I would have a hard time not being as exuberant. Um, And, you know, you need to watch this right now. Like, you know, I try not to do that because, again, I know what that leads to. And I've, I've, I mean, I've told people, you know, close friends of mine, go watch Freaked. It's, you know, it's fucking hilarious. Most of the time people come back and say, oh, yeah, that was a fun movie. But there are a couple of people that come back like, this is a fucking movie that you like. Right. Why are you so high on this movie, Chris? What, What is going on? Exactly. And it's like, I don't, I don't feel like defending to you why I love this movie so much. Cause theoretically the idea for me telling you how much I loved it was for you to go and find out and walk away with the same feeling that I did. And I totally get why that doesn't always happen. But yeah, to your point, probably best to temper thine expectations when talking about a film like Babe Pig in the City, as good as it is. It's not, you know, uh, unfounded cinema gem that the world is not ready for even in 2020 like it's it's just not that but it is a very good very well made very well acted film directed by the guy who directed fucking Mad Max mm-hmm. but and I say but it is a muddy muddled all over the place story and I at times had a hard time really figuring out where the story was going because I'm not sure it knew where it was going. It felt like it was more content on having something to say and not really telling a story at times because the film wraps up super quick. Yeah, There's not really an antagonist. I mean, there kind of is. It seems to be the universe as a whole is the antagonist. Similarly to, like you mentioned, Lemony Snicket's I think is a very good example because it does feel like kind of the universe is out to get everyone as opposed to just one specific person. I mean, the in, the entire addition of a narrator would lead you to believe that he knows that the universe is going to be interacting with the story in a way and he's almost the voice for the universe in a way. And you see that with the scene where the dog almost drowns, and you see that at the beginning with the scene where James Cromwell's character gets essentially taken out of the film before the film even ever, even ever gets going. Right, that whole, what is it, uh, uh, the, the question that gets asked, and that it keeps repeating it, you know, like, why why did this happen? What if this hadn't happened? What, you know, and just the way, you know, should he should have held on to the rope and all of these things. Yeah, it is very much... Babe versus the universe, because, I mean, the neighbor across the street is a little bit of an antagonist. The uh, woman who's running the pound is a little bit of an antagonist. The way that the the people come in and clean out the hotel of all of the the animals that are living there, uh, I really thought that they were from, like, I don't know, Nim or something. I thought that they would be experimenting on these people, uh, these animals. I thought that it was going to go even darker than it already was. Well, and it very well may have. I mean, again, you know, we don't know what the original script looked like. But again, I feel like, for me, and you just kind of mentioned it, the reason that I have an issue with the film's kind of plot is because it feels like this was maybe an idea for a darker film and they were told to tone it down and kind of take, like, take a step back, guys. This is, you know, I can imagine the meeting. Take a step back, guys. This is still a film for kids, And this is still a G-rated film. There's no way around it. It's G-rated. So you can't do anything about that. You can approach some topics. And I'm surprised in a G-rated film they had a line about a dog being thrown into a river. Yeah. Uh, But, yeah, I mean, again, that that is kind of the spot where the film gets kneecapped a little bit. Is that it is still a G-rated film. It doesn't feel like it's able to really talk about the things it wants to talk about all the way. It feels like it kind of has to do maybe 
halfway or a little bit in a roundabout way or again in shocking one-off lines that seemingly go nowhere but that you know that's kind of the issue i have with this movie is that the, there's no plot and you know the plot of they go to the city and it's all misadventures is fine but I, i'm i'm i want more than that and that's mm-hmm. a me problem not a movie problem right right it is you know, all on your shoulders <laughs> the pig is on my shoulders with everybody else. But, you know, again, it's just, I, I mean, we, even Mickey Rooney's in this movie. We haven't even talked about that because feels like he's in this film from another fucking movie. Uh, he's like mute and he's eating all the time and he's yeah. a clown. Yeah. He amuses me. <laughs> yeah. Well, he also dies. <laughs> Apparently, <laughs> yeah. quote unquote, dead. B- before I we started know. recording, I asked Chris, I was like, what the hell happened to the character? Because he just seemed to disappear. And you reminded me that he's taken out in a stretcher at one point. But it's like, I don't even remember that. Well, he apparently dies because we never see him again. Uh, the Wikipedia, which we do use to kind of make sure we understand what the hell is going on sometimes, claims that he goes to the hospital in a food coma. But then... The character of Miss Flume, played by Mary Stein, says, like, he's dead. Like, you don't die from that. Right. Food coma is, food coma is not a real coma. Uh, postprodantial soma lensens is a real thing. A food coma, you know, whatever you want to call it. But, like, you don't die from that. Even in a children's film, you don't <laughs> die from that. But, again, he feels like he's here from another movie. He really does. And the scene where Babe kind of destroys his act is is a great scene. But, like, I want to know what the fuck was Mickey Rooney doing in this movie? Yeah. He doesn't add anything. It was strange. I mean, it was kind of stunt casty a little. But, like, until the movie started rolling and he showed up on screen, I had no idea that he was in this. I, I'm not trying to, like, you know, denigrate him. I'm just like, oh, okay, like... He's kind of a big deal in that he shows up in this and just, you know, does his little spiel and stuff and then goes away. I'm like, oh, okay, that was interesting that it was just such a quick part. And I I never heard, maybe it was in David's article, but I do not remember, like, oh, yeah, and Mickey Rooney is part of this lunacy. And he's a clown doing a clown bit to an Edith Piaf song. Like, right. <laughs> What? Who are you writing this movie for? <laughs> like, I I genuinely wonder what some of the choices are that they made. Mickey Rooney going darker. The going darker pays off, but the Mickey Rooney character, I just again, it's it's another addition to this film that goes nowhere. Uh-huh. It feels like he's introduced to introduce the Stephen Wright chimpanzee kind of enclave that's in this yeah, hotel apartment for for wayward animals, but. Yeah, I guess he dies off screen, question mark. Yeah. They say he, and he's got the worst name in film history. Ugh. Bugly Flume. Fugly. It's not even a name. That's not a person's name. <laughs> yeah, when they kept calling him Fugly, I was like, that means something. Do you want it to mean that? Are you calling him fucking ugly? Yeah. <laughs> I, that's what you're going for, right? Uh, I guess. And he wasn't that fugly. I mean, no. He was just Mickey Rooney. Old Mickey Rooney. At least he wasn't in the getup he was in from Breakfast at Tiffany's. Yeah, could have been worse. Yeah, it could have been a lot, a lot, a, a lot worse. But, um, so, Mike, what would you give Babe Pig in the City out of five? And if you give it anything less than five, I guess we both disappoint our friends who really like this movie, <laughs> I right? know. I'm sorry, David, I'm giving it a four. I would give it a four as well. Like, I'm right there with you. It is, I'm not surprised it's good. I don't think you are either, right? Mm. Like, the person whose opinion I'm trusting with watching this film, I trust their opinion. Not completely, but I trust it enough to obviously program this film into the month. But it's good. Yeah. But I'm not super surprised it's good. I'm more surprised at how it didn't live up to what they had talked about. <laughs> right. Well, But I guess it never was going to anyways. Now I'm kind of curious to watch the Happy Feet movies. So, Happy Feet 1, I don't remember at all. I don't even think I've seen the first one. I know I saw the second one. The second one has Matt Damon and... Oh, God, who's the other person? It's Matt Damon and Brad Pitt, and they play, like, these two krill that are going through, like, an existential crisis. And it's, again, not 
what you would expect from a, quote, children's film, young adult film. But I would check it out. I'm actually I'm actually very, you know, interested in checking it out. It's also got Robin Williams in it, so, you know, and Elijah Wood, so it can't all be bad. But, yeah, I, I remember liking the second one, but I haven't seen the first one, if at all, or in a, quote, long time. So. Well, how are you going to understand the second one if you don't watch the first one? That's fair. Uh, you know, the other thing that, you know, talking about George Miller, and this is, you know, the way I wanted to close this episode out, again, is em- emphasizing you should watch this movie and emphasizing the fact that it's a George Miller film. The biggest disappointment that I have whenever I talk about George Miller is the fact that we never got that George Miller Justice League film. Yeah. Yeah. Because, like, I know everybody goes on and on and on about the fucking Burton Superman film, and I know that... Um, uh, rest his soul, the guy who made the documentary that passed away a couple years ago, he essentially put to bed that Superman, Tim Burton movie, right? I mean, that's... I want someone to do that for Justice League because that movie sounded like it was farther along than Superman. And the upside for that film would have had massive ramifications on Hollywood for a very long time. Right. I mean, I've read... Well, I read many of the scripts for what that Superman film was supposed to be, and it was garbage. So, um, <laughs> it's like... No, like, yeah, like, that Superman movie was not going to be good. It was no. going to be something interesting to look at. Yeah. But I don't think it was going to be good, guys. No, like, I think it would have been kind of a disaster had it actually gotten made. I mean, just... Yeah, it, it's like I was just reading an article about uh, Indiana Jones 4, and, you know, it's like, oh, well, there are some redeeming things about Indiana Jones 4, and it's like, the only good thing I can say about Indiana Jones 4 is I read the script for, I think, three drafts before they came to Crystal Skull, and those were even worse than the Crystal Skull. So that's the only good thing I can say about it, is that it's not as bad as it could have been. Yeah. No, I 100% agree. Again, that that documentary, uh, what the hell is it called? Uh, oh, man. What, The I, Death I, of Superman I, Lives? That's what it is, yep. Yep. Uh, you know, I, I think it puts to bed that movie pretty succinctly. Yeah. I want something like that for Justice League. I mean, Justice League was going to have Army Hammer as Batman. Guys, if that doesn't sound appealing, like, I don't know what does. Like, Army Hammer's a great fucking actor. The woman who was going to be Wonder Woman, who, she's... In Fury Road, briefly, she's one of the mothers that um, Furiosa goes to see. I think she might even be, that's bait. I think that's the woman, is the naked woman in the cage. Yeah, she is amazing. I've seen her in other things. She used to host, um, I I think it was Project Runway, the um, Australian version. So I was very familiar with her. And when I heard that she was going to be Wonder Woman, I was like, oh, fuck yeah, she could do an awesome job. Yeah, it's, I mean, it is one of those things, like, one of those films, and there are several that kind of get talked about in these whispered hush tones of, like, what if, what if, big what if. The Justice League Mortal is what it would have been called, is is kind of the the one that really gets me excited to talk about kind of what could have been, because it did come at a time where, you know, we're just about to be done with the Bale, or I guess we're, we're halfway through Bale's run as... Batman because it would have they started production on it right before or during Dark Knight Rises. Dark Knight Rises comes out and then you know they go uh if we can't get Christian Bale we'll get someone else and then obviously Zack Snyder comes and Nolan and they kind of fuck everything up. Thanks guys. Uh yeah because it's sad because I mean it just I mean again this completely off topic but not really Justice League Mortal felt like a time where Warner Brothers pivoted and they pivoted away from what would have been successful into the fucking nightmare we have now, which is a bunch of movies that are not connected because they can't connect them because the actors don't want to come back or they can't figure out how to get a movie off the ground because one of the actors beats the shit out of women. And I just described multiple actors involved with this scene. <laughs> uh, um, I, I have yet to actually... I know we're so far off topic right now, but I have yet to actually figure out what... It's the guy's name, Ray Fisher. Oh, the guy who played Cyborg. Yeah. yeah. I have no idea what he's complaining about. I just keep hearing like, blah, blah, blah. Joss Whedon's a piece of shit. I'm just like, okay, first off, tell me something I don't know. Second right. off, why is he a piece of shit? Like, I have yet to hear the why for he's a piece of shit. 
I think it had something to do with the cyborg scenes were all cut out of the film, and Joss Whedon didn't conduct himself professionally on set. The I mean, was he should walking around with his with his wiener out or something? Uh, what was he walking around with his wiener? I mean, the way that he is described by Ray Fisher, it sounds like I was like, what is he like a pe- pedo or something? Like, what's going on? Why is he such an awful person? I think it's just the way I th- I think I think what it is is like you know we've talked about this before someone like Hitchcock right they couldn't really exist anymore right. because of the way they treated the actors I think that's what it is Oh okay which is weird cuz like you've never heard that about Joss Whedon before you've heard other things other improprieties and and other things that he's done but you've never heard that Right. At all. Because, I mean, you never heard that when he worked on Avengers 1 or 2. Avengers 2, you heard uh, him him bitching about Marvel kind of treating him poorly because they wanted him to shoehorn every fucking thing into that movie. But you never hear Joss Whedon being painted as poorly as he's being painted now because of Justice League. He's gone, like, completely quiet. Yeah. Shockingly so. Yeah. So... Yeah, I don't know. Just you know, Justice League Mortal. Ju- George Miller was going to direct it. It would have been. It might not have been amazing, but it would have been better than we what we got, which was a film that now we're having a studio spend seventy fucking million dollars on to fix. Are we going to have to do an episode about the quote unquote Schneider cut when it comes oh, out? I think now you signed yourself up for it. It's going to be like four fucking hours long, right? Like, how can it be the Schneider cut when it's like, oh, we're we're reshooting this. We're we're now we're adding like fucking Will Smith to the movie and this person and this person and this. And I'm like, that's not a a, a cut of a movie. That's reshoots. That that's new stuff that you're shooting. And look, both of us are huge fans of Ozploitation film. We Mike White March last year of 2019 was Ozploitation, and the fact that Hugh. Keys Baron was going to be in Justice League Mortal pissed oh, me off. Oh God, yes. You know, supposedly was going to play Martian Manhunter. I don't know if that would have worked, but I mean, look, he played Immortan Joe, and everybody shit their pants at how great that was. So, I mean, he didn't have to do much. He's fucking amazing on his own. Yeah, exactly. I mean, he's hiding underneath all of that stuff, and he still gives that amazing performance. You you can't even see the man's mouth moving the entire movie, and it's just with his eyes and with that voice. Yeah, and again, that's there's just so many, like, what-ifs in Hollywood that get kicked around, but Justice League Mortal, for me, is the one, and that's because, A, I love Superman and I love Batman, and B, because I know what we ended up getting, and what we ended up getting ended up being a bigger fucking headache for Warner Brothers. I think they probably wish they had made Justice League Mortal, yeah. all things considered, given, you know, where we are now. And to your point, we're going to have to do a podcast on the Snyder Cut. I don't want to. I already talked about Justice League. That movie's a piece of shit. Yep. It is a bad film made by bad filmmakers who don't understand what it takes to make a good superhero film. As much as I don't like the Nolan movies, Christopher Nolan at least kind of got it or kind of said fuck it and did his own thing anyways. That's more of what it was. But yeah, Justice League Mortal could have prevented all of the Snyder Cut bullshit outright. Like we wouldn't even, we would never be talking about Zack Snyder and Joss Whedon making a film together even though they didn't. I want to live in that world. Uh, please. Yeah, please. God. Uh, but all of our bitching aside, let's take a break and we'll play a preview for the next Culture Cast. There is a balance to the universe. The struggle to maintain that balance is the stuff of legends. For there can be no good without evil, no love without hate. Life needs death. Innocence feeds lust. There can be no heaven without hell, no light without me. I am darkness. It's 
right, on the next Culture Cast, we're going to be talking about yet another film that I have not seen. This has not been on a long list, though, like the last two. We're going to be talking about Ridley Scott's Legend, both oh. the original and the director cut. Okay, yeah. I don't like Ridley Scott, Mike. Well, he's hit or miss kind of his for own me. fault, right? Yeah, he's very hit or miss. Does only liking two of his movies and none of the other ones count as hit or miss, or just two hits and every other miss? Well, okay. I mean, he made Alien and Blade Runner back to back. I've said it before, I'll say it again. If you made just Blade Runner or just Alien, you could rest on your laurels for the rest of your career and no one would ever bitch at you. He made those two back to back and then has made nothing of value since. I I liked, and I'll emphasize liked, I liked The Martian, but I think anybody could have directed that movie. Possibly exactly. anybody. Uh, Matt Damon could have directed that movie and starred in it. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. I think I'm doing an episode on The Counselor one of these days because people keep telling me that that's just this amazing thing. The director's cut of it. And I, I don't believe it. So I, I have to see. I have to force myself to watch that one. All I know is that Cameron Diaz is naked at one point doing like a striptease on the hood of a car. That's what that, I know about is it, that too. that movie? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I fucking hate Hannibal. I'm not a fan of Gladiator. Yeah, And that has Oliver Reed in it. And we both love Oliver Reed. Yeah. But, like, I don't want to watch a fucking movie where Oliver Reed's in the first ten minutes. <laughs> or whatever. Because he plays, what, Proximus the slave holder? Something. Slave dealer? I haven't seen this since the, since the theater. And that was another one. When I watched that movie, I was just like, this is filmed in Confuso Vision. Because some of those fights, especially, like, there's a, glad, a fight with the Centurions in a forest. And it is so chopped to shit that the, the you can barely tell who's fighting who. And it was, like, right at that dawn of we are going to overcut fights so that you can't tell what the hell's going on. Which is what we talked about on the last episode, actually. So coincidentally, ah. well, I mean, it's a thing, right? Like all of a sudden, sometime in like the early 2000s, late 90s, they were like, everything's got to be two to three seconds long, if that. It's like, Whoa, wait, <laughs> no, why? There's like that that breakdown of uh, Liam Neeson jumping a fence in one of his movies. I don't know if it was Taken or like the the graveyard film or whatever. And it's just like... I think he cut. He jumps the fence in like thirteen cuts, and it's like what? Yeah, like look at Jackie Chan. He can do it all in a oneer. Like I don't need thirteen cuts to get Liam Neeson over a fence. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, I, I again, I, I lamented it on the last episode. It came back up, reared its ugly head once again. Quick cuts and two to three second action cut scenes. Again, I wasn't the. I, I like Fury Road. Again, I, it's not my favorite movie of all time. But fucking hell, that movie doesn't have that. No. And again, George Miller, I mean, it goes it goes to show the director has a lot more to do with the quality of shit than people like to claim, especially when it comes to an eye for action. I will give Zack Snyder credit. He has an eye for action. He doesn't know how to cut and edit action. Yeah. But he has an eye for it. And, you know, Ridley Scott, I feel bad because he doesn't... <laughs> He doesn't deserve the way I feel about him to be a thing because he did make Alien and Blade Runner, one of those movies I love to death. The other one, I really oscillate on Blade Runner. I never want to do a podcast on it because, like, it feels like a movie that eats its own lunch every time anyone talks about it. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. It's – I – Saw Blade Runner in the theater. I saw it on cable. I loved it. And then once he started going in and fucking around with it, it was just like, stop. Please stop. The only thing I can say that I really like about Ridley Scott is that he allows the other versions to exist. I think he's completely wrong in having to say that, like, and just beating us over the head, suddenly saying, Deckard's a replicant, Deckard's a replicant, Deckard's a replicant. Let me be able to think he might be he might not be don't just like kill me with shoving something down my throat that i don't think tastes very good well and ultimately also at the end of the day you're completely pulling the, the wind out of the sails of your story because whether or not deckard's a replicant doesn't matter to the first movie right at, at all like you you could never have that question asked and still love that movie yeah. But yet, like you said, Ridley Scott goes in and he's like, but this is the important thing. It's like, even in fucking Blade Runner 2049, a flawed film that I still like, they do it there, but 
Dennis Villeneuve does it in a way that isn't the Ridley Scott way, where he just takes a two by four labeled Deckard's a replicant and beats you over the head with it until you're like, stop, please, no more. <sighs> I mean, the unicorns and all that shit's like, oh my God, would you fucking oh, yeah. stop it? Ugh. But yeah, we're going to be talking about Legend. I've never seen it. So, and who better to be on a podcast about a film that I've never seen? Oh. Than fucking Father Mole. <laughs> there you go. All through exactly. the episode, you can just say, I've never seen it. And he, it's like a bat signal. He just shows up. Like, I'm here. <laughs> Maybe you should go into the episode without actually having watched the movie. Oh, and I'll just be like, I love Tim Curry in this film. I like the way he looks. Did you watch it? No. No, I've never seen it. <laughs> Literally, and I've still never seen it. We're talking about it right now. <laughs> oh, my God. Until that episode, what have you been up to, Mike? Well, it is November over at the projection booth, which we call, get ready for it, Noir Vember. Are you, yeah, it's kind of funny, right? Um, I, mean, I like so, it. Yeah, okay. I mean, it works for me. It gives me an excuse to watch film noir. That we're doing some neo noir this month, and um, believe it or not, we have an episode coming out about to live and die in L.A. where I managed to talk to the one and only Willem Dafoe. So I'm very happy to have Wait, that. Wait, what? Feather. Yeah. You didn't see that on my Facebook. Yeah. I talked with Willem Dafoe. He will be one of my two interviews for the To Live and Die in L.A. episode, and that will be available day before Thanksgiving. You know what that sound was that you just heard? Thousands of people leaving. Thousands. Ha! Hundreds. Ha! Couple people leaving this podcast and going, this guy doesn't talk to Willem Dafoe. <laughs> but that guy does. <laughs> so, fuck this podcast. I'm out of here. Oh, man. That's awesome. See, that's the thing. We need to grow as a community and not push each other down. <laughs> we right. all grow together. <laughs> How did... Okay, we'll talk about it after. Um, as for me, I didn't get to talk to Willem Dafoe, but you can find me on Twitter at casualty underscore Chris. You can find the podcast on Twitter at culturecast dot... Or at culturecast. And on the internet at culturecast.com. Big thanks to you, Mike, for joining me. I know we had a little bit of a host shuffle here on this episode uh, a couple people i think three actually dropped off so it ended up being me and you but you were not my second choice so don't even level that against me <laughs> but uh yeah and uh and as always make sure to check out the next episode <laughs>